And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us all the way from Nord Games, creators of the upcoming... Again, Upcoming book, Dangerous Destinations, which managed to get itself funded in uh, in quick, fast, in a hurry. The one and only Chris Haskins. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing pretty good. Thanks for the intro. Thank, thank you. I try, I try and do my best and try and, do, and try and get as close to Bombast without getting sued by the Buffer family. <laughs> oh. So, it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. With that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Oh, my very first? So, I was uh, 16, mm -hmm. and uh, I was spending a weekend with my uncle. My brother and I drove from uh, our, our dad's place in San Francisco up to Sacramento uh, to our uncle's place. He needed some help with a bunch of yard work, and it had to be the hottest weekend on record in in uh, Sacramento up till that point, and this is going back about year two thousand or so, and uh, it was so hot that we just could not be out in the yard during the middle of the day. So we were we were getting to, you know getting things going early in the morning, and then we would break in the middle of the day, and then we would get back to things in the evening. And even even then, it was still super super hot in the evening. But we were all hanging out. I think it was the second day, all hanging out inside in the air conditioning and my uncle just sort of threw out an idea. It was like, you guys want to play D and D? And I turned around and I was like, isn't that that nerdy game? <laughs> and I, yeah, it, it was just so funny. He, he just reeled, you know, like, Oh my goodness. No, it is, it is a whole world of exciting adventures. And I said, well, I'm game. Let's, and my brother said, yeah, I'll go for it. And we had been very familiar with video games, uh, you know, role-playing games, uh, my very first video game was Zelda on the Nintendo Entertainment System. So mm -hmm. I was familiar with the idea of having, you know, uh, magic and and uh, weapons and, and all kinds of stuff. And I think that at that point in time, Diablo 2 may have been our standard when it came to role playing games. And, you know, that's more of a hack and slash less RPG. But uh, still, we were familiar with the concept. And so... My uncle pulled out all of his second edition books and just a ton of awesome stuff. And he showed me these amazing dice that I had no idea what they were all about. I'd never seen a D20 or a D10 or a D12 before. I was familiar with D6s from traditional board games. And so we got to rolling up characters and got really into it. And we probably spent a couple of hours just talking about our characters and talking about, you know, the whole creative process. And this was with second edition. So it wasn't that in depth, but my uncle had added a lot of flavor into his, his own campaign. As we all do, we, we make it our own and we played for hours. And I think we ended up maybe spending an extra day there. Uh, I think it, it was in the summer, so we had no school or anything like that. And uh, so we just stayed and mm -hmm. we ended up playing. Uh, one of my uncle's friends was also there. And so uh, the three of us were the party and my uncle was the, dungeon master and we went on some great adventures uh adventures that we my brother and i can still remember to this day and we'll mention to each other you know hey remember that one time this happened you know and so after that the two of us got into it and got our friends into it and at the time i think the standard was third 3.5 um and so we got some some books and uh started to go on our own adventures and it's really just stuck with me ever since then, and um, I mean, it's been 20 years now. Mm -hmm. And that that uh, if I may if I may take a bit of a stab in the dark, that first introduction when it came to when it came to D and D, um, was it like whenever whenever I hear people's early starts, it, especially especially in a story like that. Um, was it Redbox, or were, or was it full on third? Was it full on third edition by the time you started? 
Well, we were playing second edition, and the right. I don't remember there being a a box involved. I remember uh, my uncle had second edition books, very heavily used second edition books, which I actually have now in my collection. And so uh, I, I don't remember anything about it being a red box or uh, I think there was a white box and stuff too. But um, it was, it was uh, you know, advanced Dungeons and Dragons, you know, second edition. All right. Which means you probably had to explain Thacko about three or four different times. <laughs> that was a very confusing aspect mm -hmm. for me. Uh, although my uncle had created his own character sheets on a dot matrix printer of all things. So back when he was in high school and college, he, he played a lot of D&D. &D, and what he ended up doing was he created his own character sheet that he liked a bit better for the style and all that. And I think that he actually did change it over to... Um, what we traditionally use now. Yeah. So um, ascending um, AC. Yeah. And he was, he was explaining that go to us and he said, we could play that way or we could play with the ascending AC style. And we said, well, what, whatever's simpler. Mm -hmm. And so um, we tried it, tried that go just in, in concept a couple of times. And then we're like, yeah, let's just go with the ascending. Uh, and I think that I've heard from, from some of the grognards that uh, that was really, Gary Gygax's um, showing off his mathematical uh, abilities and stuff, and some of the original creators saying, "Yeah, let's make it extra complicated because math." And you know, you, you have a certain appreciation for that. But when it comes to simplicity, I much prefer the the current system, the ascending AC. Um, me personally, I've I've been of the mindset that Thaco is not a bad system; it's a all right system that's poorly explained. It, and it's because of, of you know, negative numbers and, and all that stuff that can be more difficult to understand. I've played in, uh, like, Stefan Picorni's game at Dwarven Forge. Uh, mm -hmm. I've played in his game uh, a few times, and he uses Thacko. And all I ask him is, what do you want me to roll? And so, you know, but he's already got the little table explained on his character sheet. He makes custom character sheets. Mm -hmm. So he's got the little table explained on there. And so... Uh, that makes it a little bit easier, but yep. I always start with saying, "What do I got to hit?" And you know, and, and then I aim for that. Yeah, and um, I've of course, and and I've I've done plenty of stuff with um, Axe Adventure Conqueror King system, which technically uses that Thaco, but because of the way it's because of the way it's set up, you already ha you already know what the minimums you need to roll are gonna are gonna be, and mm -hmm. then you and then. You just ask what somebody's AC is and go with that. And um, Kevin Crawford's stuff with, say, Godbound, everything revolves around a rule of 20. And in that case, a AC is actually is actually going to add, is going to add to your roll. Um, and it's and everything goes down to as long as you as long as you your total is tw is 20, you hit. Yeah, I think that uh, the current standard of D and D fifth mm -hmm. edition and, and second edition Pathfinder. I think they're doing it right. I think that that's the simplest way to, um, uh, to introduce the concept to people. And also, uh, sometimes people go, well, I got, you know, I need a, a 15. I got a 14. And I go, well, you, you hit the target, but his armor deflected any damage. So, you know, I, I often when I'm dungeon mastering is I will consider everything up to everything within a range of maybe four or five to actually be a successful hit of the target is just not going to do any damage because of this or this reason, whatever. So uh, that way people don't feel like they've completely missed every single hit that wasn't actually, you know, meeting or, or passing the AC uh, required. So, you know, that's, that's more of a narrative way of approaching it. And obviously, you know, if they're rolling, you know, threes and fours, then it's like, okay, you're, you're missing those shots. Those are, that may into something. That happens to that target because they are holding their shield up to take these arrows uh, that means that maybe another character is able to come in and, and uh, 
you know, sweep the leg or whatever. So uh, that I think can be helpful in, uh, in playing into the narrative of the combat. Yeah. And that bring, that brings me to um, dangerous destinations. The, the, um, which I'd say, I'd say is the, I'd say is the sequel to your previous work, um, spectacular settlements. And, I do have to. I do have to ask th this whole alliteration thing with with your previous one and now th with this project. Was that just was that just one of those things that just stumbled into by accident? Uh, no, we we often try to go for alliteration if we can because why not? Uh, but <laughs> but we try to use evocative words whenever possible, and if they happen to. Uh, alliterate with each other if that's the right way of using that word uh then even better so you know so particular settlements dangerous destinations and whatever's going to come after it the alliteration is fun for us and i know it's fun for our customers so why not do it that way and we feel that the the titles we've chosen have are, are broad enough um while still being evocative mm-hmm and t now with spectac now within within that you're setting this up as a as a system agnostic um approach to well as the title as the title says dangerous destinations and yeah. what i'm cu what i'm curious about is how is um th how did this how did this come about and what and was it always the plan to have this be system agnostic or er, in early developments were you using certain systems as a framework? Well, so settlements, that one started out mm -hmm. as being a fifth edition product. But then as we developed it more and more, we realized the only thing in it that pertained to fifth edition were the stat blocks for the non-player characters. And so we thought, uh, you know, we could very easily remove the stat blocks and make mm -hmm. this whole book system agnostic. And so that's what we did. And then the follow-up being dangerous destinations, it made sense to make that one system agnostic as well. So mm -hmm. there are, uh, and in this one, instead of there being non-player characters, we have antagonists. So the antagonist chapter, it sort of replaces the, the non-player characters chapter for, for settlements in, 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 in destinations. So if you, if you are, uh, you know, looking at them apples to apples, basically the builders for each one of the different settlement types uh, from, from settlements are being replaced by builders containing uh, destination type uh, environment and danger. So that those three chapters build out, all the variables you need um, to make your dangerous destination. And those, you know, are, are in settlements. Those were how to build a, a different type of settlement, a trading post, a, a village, a town, a city, that kind of thing. Uh, and then after those chapters and settlements, we had non-player characters. Well, for this one, we were like, well, this is all dangerous destinations. We don't need a bunch of non-player characters necessarily, except for, antagonists would be very cool to have in here and what we decided to do was approach it from more of a, um, a broad term and uh, what we call them is antagonist profiles so you can apply this antagonist profile to any of your you know intelligent monsters or humanoids or whatever you, you can apply that to any uh character that you're bringing into the story to be a villain or being an underboss or whatever. So uh, that approach makes it much more versatile. There's a constant fight with design and development uh, over um, versatility and detail. The more detail, the less versatile. The more versatile, the less detail. So there's a point at which if you were to draw that on a, on a graph, or a line chart or something, you would find that there's a very nice middle point. And so we try to aim for that middle point as much as possible so that this is a product that will be as applicable as possible in your games, as usable and all that, um, but not so detailed to where it's it's not going to be 
uh, usable because your world doesn't have an X, Y, Z, or, you know, it doesn't have something that we call out in the, in the book itself. Basically, if you're running a fantasy themed role-playing game or you're writing a fantasy themed story, this book is going to work for you. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to, when it comes to the um, step builder system, now you, it's it starts out with the destination types, and I'm yes. curious what the what types of destinations one could expect from the book. Well, on the main page of the campaign, mm -hmm. you can look there, but uh, these are all going to be your pretty standard um, uh, overarching concepts. Mm -hmm. So there's a barrel ground, um, there is a hideout. Um, there are, uh, there are also settlements. So you could, in, in the settlement section, they're very abbreviated version of, of the actual settlements in spectacular settlements, but you could very well use, uh, our settlements book to make your settlement and then continue the process with dangerous destinations to figure out what makes it so dangerous. Um, so there, there are going to be 12 different options for the destination type, and then, you move on to the 12 different standard environments mm -hmm. that, that destination could exist in. And then beyond that, you have six different categories of dangers. And those could be, um, you know, beasts, uh, and unintelligent monsters, could be intelligent monsters, could be humanoids, could be an event, uh, could be magic. So there's lots of different, or an item, uh, could be a lot of different possibilities. And then with, when, within those different categories are a ton of different options and what's interesting about this book is the addition of the dangers section mm -hmm. really starts to build out more about a story or or an overarching um thing that is happening around this area that you're creating and that was sort of an unexpected uh outcome but very welcome as if you've watched any of our, our live streams, which we're live streaming every uh, Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time uh, on our YouTube, Twitch, and, and Facebook, what we're doing is actually using the builder with a live audience to show you how it works. And we're, we're building out uh, different combinations of the destination type, environment, and, and danger. And mm -hmm. what, that, what that creates is, I'm not even sure how many possibilities there are because there are so many different option options within options. So, um, but it's, it's all presented in such a way that you can very quickly roll through it. And if I were to be doing it by myself, I could probably get through a, a dangerous destination in about five minutes, uh, fleshing out all of the details. You know, what type is it? Where is it located? Uh, what are the current weather patterns and, and that kind of thing? What am I, he, hearing, seeing, and smelling on my way up to this destination as I'm on the approach. Uh, and then what sort of danger exists here? So you can get it done in pretty short order. We usually talk about it a lot. We bounce ideas off of each other a lot during the live mm -hmm. stream, and we get a lot of input from the, uh, from the viewers. Mm -hmm. So it takes a lot longer than that. But uh, it's something that you can build pretty quickly, and you can also do it on the fly if you wanted to. So you could do it before your game uh, as prep, uh, you know, to get inspired, to get some ideas, some creative juices flowing, or you could do it on the fly as the players approach and you only have a couple of details worked out so far, but as they ask you more and more questions uh, about, you know, what are they seeing here? What are, what are the general, uh, you know, lay land like? You can make a couple of roles and answer those questions. And so, uh, and a technique I've seen, used for this kind of thing is you actually put it on the players to, you know, jot it down in their journal so that you don't have to keep track of all these things and slow them, slow down the gameplay. Instead, you make some roles and they're the ones who are recording it. Just like old school, no one had any maps that they showed the players. They had a map that they were looking at behind the Dungeon Master screen mm -hmm. and they, the players were expected to accurately draw out the map mm -hmm. as they went along using the description that the dungeon master was giving them. So if they mm -hmm. didn't get it right, they were SOL well when it came to trying to escape the dungeon, you know, that kind of thing. So anyway, that's another way that you could use it, this book uh, on the fly and put some of the, um, some of the work onto the players to keep track of some of the details. Yeah. 
and when it com when it comes to the uh, when it comes to the setup for for these, we've mentioned the whole thing with with dungeons, but could something like dangerous destinations be used just as well as somebody we wanted to do a uh, campaign that leaned a little more on the hex crawl end of things? Because in in recent times, hex crawl is aside from the OSR community seems to be a play style that isn't touched upon as much. You could definitely use it for that kind of thing if you were on a, an exploration sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. y you could totally do that. Uh, in in that case, you probably would want to have some environments established beforehand, uh, some idea, uh, and if you already have a map to where they know in general the mountains are off that way and the forests are off that way, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but that would that would negate that role for you as far as location the environment um you would just be rolling for the destination type and then the danger but all the details about the environment you could establish using our book because there are a lot of variables even within the environment so mm -hmm. um yeah and, and i encourage anybody to check out any of our live streams to understand more and more what i'm talking about because we do show on the live stream a version of the, the, the book, the current manuscript in um, just a mock-up where we are making rolls against those, those tables uh, and sometimes picking them. Uh, in a couple mm -hmm. of our episodes, we, we decided we'd, we'd pick uh, outcomes and roll other outcomes. So, um, yeah, that, that's, if you want to go hex crawl with it, you could definitely do that. The whole idea is to provide inspiration and get storytellers to break their typical tropes or their you know, break out of their comfort zone. I find that myself, I've been dungeon master for 20 years and obviously over the past 10 years, I'm a whole lot better than I was the first 10 years, but even still I am finding that I often will revert to type. If you will, I would off often, I will create a very similar adventure to the last one that I did because that one was a lot of fun. Why not? But I part of part of the product part of the reason we make the products we make is because we want to use them ourselves. <laughs> and so if you can have a product that solves some of your, your own problems as a creator and those problems being I want to break out of my typical, you know, mold, then you know, even better. You've made, you've created a a product that you can use at your own games to make your own games better and if other people can use it then why not? Why not share it with the world? Yeah. Now Given the given the fact that it, that the setup seems to be based on um, on a on a series of pillars, that being what that being um, the pl the place, the environment, and the da and the danger. Um, what I'm what I'm a bit curious on in that in that sense is in regard to. Um, I'll start. I'll start with environments, and you. It did. The Kickstarter page does list um, potential environments that could that could be seen. Um, a lot of them are ones that I'd are ones that I'd kind of expect. One that I'm a bit curious, and I'd like to get a bit more detail on, is what you're shooting for with extra planar. Yeah, I knew that question was coming. So, uh, extra planar is going to be an interesting chapter for sure because that will be a lot of environments all in one so we're gonna have to sort of cut it off at a certain point because extra planar just think about all the crazy trippy worlds that could exist where you go to a place where all of the trees are made of fire or something i you know just what weird stuff you can come up with and i think that is going to be one of those uh one of those chapters that a lot of people will utilize when they want things to get really weird in their their campaigns so i imagine that it's going to break a lot of the norms of our universe mm -hmm. and how we as human beings see the world and we go oh this makes sense because there's air and there's clouds and there's you know trees and there's grass and all the typical stuff you would expect to see you might not see maybe an extra planar world exists where all of the uh, there, there are no um, 
no plants, only mushrooms. So everything that would normally be a plant in the environment is a type of mushroom. And so all of the trees are just really, really tall mushrooms and all of the uh, grass is all little, little teeny tiny mushrooms. And so that's an example of how things start to, they, they start to get weird from our perspective as human beings living in our universe. And mm -hmm. so imagine the kind of weird stuff that would exist in an elemental plane of existence. So, you know, you, you cross over to the water, uh, with the water plane, you know, what does that look like? And that's where we're going to help to guide you through that. If you're going to go that direction, what sort of things are your heroes going to experience? That's really what we're trying to lay down. And extra planar is going to be one of those really, really weird ones. And uh, it'll be a lot of fun, but it, things will get weird real quick. Well, give, given, cer given certain extra planar um, areas... I think we I think weirdness is kind of expected. And I will admit to that I ended up thinking of the extra thought as an album cover. cover for a um for a doom metal band yeah that one definitely gets into an area where we we don't typically see mm -hmm. and uh dinosaurs and you know very tropical er uh, most i think most people and this is from my experience playing in other people's games most people use uh, a a european setting for mm -hmm. their fantasy adventures and i i'm talking everything looks very lord of the rings everything looks very you know knights in shining armor mm -hmm. everything it, it, you know the forgotten realms is a great example that to me seems like a very um you know dark ages or um you know european fantasy that kind of thing mm -hmm. and so uh, breaking out of that mold i think is going to be an interesting experience for a lot of people and if our book can help to do that, then then great. Um, yeah, we're just all about supplying material for inspiration and to make people uh, um, enjoy the game more and more. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to when it comes to um, dangers, um, now I, a few a few potential dangers I, I can e I can easily I can easily see, but. What I'm what I'm also what I'm also curious about is the way the way something like dangers is set up. Is it a case of these are potential like weather events, these are potential encounters in this sort of environment, and so on, or do you have a different setup with how dangers are presented with each given area? So the destination itself it gets very specific to what is the danger that is looming over this specific destination, and you can broaden it from there if you want to so uh, the last um, uh, live stream that we did it was kind of an interesting one it was an outpost located in the swamp that had a danger of uh, unintelligent monster mm -hmm. and so we were we had pretty good ideas in our mind up until the the danger came up and we were thinking okay it's going to be this it's going to be this and then the danger came in and really changed how we were thinking and, and really complemented uh some things that we were already thinking of but then made us have to have to consider you know um some of the other roles and actually roles that contradict each other aren't a bad thing because mm -hmm. they they create conflict and make you ask questions and conflict is good for storytelling so um what ended up happening was We've got this outpost. It's some sort of military contractor outpost. They're storing something of value here. And uh, it's in a swamp. The recent weather has basically been flooding and things are really getting bad here in the swamp where you know it used to be not so bad. And now they've had to 
find some alternative way of getting in and out of the outpost as the outpost is sinking into the swamp itself. So, uh, and then like, okay, that's pretty straightforward. Interesting. You know, and, and this establishes what the player characters might be experiencing on their way to this destination because it is extremely wet and stormy and all that. But then we threw in the unintelligent monster and it turned out that it was a ghoul. And so we're like, well, ghoul, what, how, how is this going to play into it? Additionally, there were, there were a flock of ravens that were in the area and stuff. So we were bouncing ideas off of each other. And, and Josh came up with the idea that the ghoul is actually a, uh, a corpse that had been buried in the swamp when it wasn't a swamp. So, mm-hmm. you know, at some point uh, there was hard ground and, People had died and they buried them. And this person, uh, they didn't want anyone to disturb the grave, so they put some sort of an incantation on it. And as the area turned into a bog, the the grave was disturbed, and this incantation turned this peat bog corpse, which if you want to Google that, feel Mm -hmm. free, but geez, it's disgusting. (laughs) Um, It turned this into a reanimated uh, you know, creature. And this Mm -hmm. thing is now, you know, similar to a ghoul, and this thing is running around. Uh, terrorizing the occupants of this outpost. So that's where the the danger can start to tell a lot more about the story. And it's it's not so one dimensional as uh, well. You can make it if you we can make it very simple if you want to. But in this case, we wanted to make it more complicated and say like, well, why is that? You know, why why is this happening? And so it presented a very interesting scene. And I know that when we write the whole thing up and add any sort of adventure to it we're going to have the player characters enter the scene where the inhabitants have been creating rope bridges from nearby trees in order to actually get into the, uh, the outpost, which is, you know, like a, it's got a a couple of towers or turrets or something on it. And uh, as they enter, they've got one person who is dangling from one of the rope bridges as the, the ghoul is, you know, reaching up and trying to pull them down uh, and, and get them into the mud, that kind of thing. So, and the, the flock of ravens is following around this, this, uh, ghoul as it, you know, eats all the local, uh, fauna and stuff and, and, uh, the ravens eat whatever's left. So you can always tell roughly where this thing has been hanging out by where the, the flock of ravens are at. So anyway, it's stuff like that, where all these details are coming into play and it's up to you to do something with it if you want to. And, uh, Again, it's a it's a it's source of inspiration, and you could have a hundred different people make the exact same roles in the book and come up with a hundred different outcomes as to what this place looks like and why people are there and you know all that. And that's again playing back into the maximum versatility and maximum detail. So give them as much details as as possible without making it. Uh, less versatile and, Mm -hmm. you know, keep that versatility as high as possible, um, you know, by giving them uh, as as much resources as they can. Yeah. Now, obviously, this is something that's going to revolve around a lot of um, table use. And I'm curious if there's if there's a particular die or or die size that most of the tables are going to revolve are going to revolve around. Is it typically like 10s and 20s? (laughs) There, there. It's all over the place. Actually, we use all of the standard polyhedrals. So, uh, and what's interesting too is we've given certain things uh, bell curves. So, on a d20, you might have an outcome on a one and a twenty, which are the two most extremes, and then you might have outcomes from let's say two, three, and four, and and then seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, and then you might have an outcome that is uh, everything in between. So mm-hmm. you've got five outcomes on a D20, but there's a rarity built into there. So uh, that way you, you've got some, uh, you've got the two extremes and then you've got the less extremes and then you've got the one that's probably most of the time this is what it's going to be. So, uh, and then other su- certain roles can modify other roles. So if you have a certain role that um, should have an impact on a role further down, the building process, then it'll call that out. It'll, you know, say add plus one when you roll this, add a mm-hmm. plus two when you roll that, that kind of thing. Yeah. And when, and uh, when it comes to, and when it comes to antagonists, I'm curious, given the fact that you are, that, um, 
that you're doing this as a more system agnostic approach as opposed to your previous work. I'm curious if I'm curious how um how the agnost how the antagonist part of it is going to be structured. So the profiles there will be oh, it's going to be a lot of profiles. I I forgot exactly how many, but all the stretch goals we achieved mm -hmm. unlocked more and more. But there will be antagonist profiles within the um, humanoids and um, and intelligent monsters, so that there is a personality that you can attach to your um, your villain, or like I said earlier, your underboss, or or you know even if it's just the village tough or whatever, and these profiles are um, taken from certain personality characteristics and they're given things like they have a desire, they have a flaw, they have something that's preventing them from, you know, reaching whatever desire that they have or whatever. So there, there's a few variables that go into who they are and what they're all about. And that is something you can generate if you want on your own, but we're going to, we're going to create a bunch uh, just to have a jumping off point for mm -hmm. you. So you can find one that seems to work quite well for the story you're trying to tell or roll randomly and it, it uh, picks one for you and you can apply that to, um, to the, the story because you don't know that yet. You don't know what the villain, uh, how the mo villain is motivated yet. So um, that allows a certain amount of, of fun too for the dungeon masters and they're discovering this as they're creating so uh, it also allows you to break outside of your comfort zone if it's something that you wouldn't normally be creating. So um, the, the gist of it is that the antagonist uh, chapter is going to present you with a lot of different options for the personality of your, your antagonist. And uh, it scales well, and it, it's applicable to any system because it's, again not too specific, but we've given you enough detail uh, based on, I think uh, someone mentioned Jungian or something. Uh, I'm not involved uh, fully with, with that section. Josh mm -hmm. is writing that section mostly, but he came up with these personality profiles from uh, actual characteristics that you see in, uh, in psychology. Yeah. And, Something I'm cur something I'm curious on that is when it when it going further into the whole antagonist thing is it is within it did did you, were you considering putting in sort of bullet points about what sort of about um what sort of general ideas on st on stats to emphasize with antagonists or was that just something that wasn't going to work? It's not going to work because. It, just because someone might crave power doesn't mean that they have more strength than other people. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So if, uh, and that's, that's one of the, the uh, personality characteristics, this person craves power, uh, you know? So I think that these are a lot more universally applicable than um, they would be if we added those suggestions to them. Now in settlements, we did suggest different attributes that would be uh their their uh strongest attribute uh as you know this npc is you know super wise or whatever you know we, we gave an, a little explanation as to what you might want to do when when rolling for stats on this character mm -hmm. uh if you actually wanted to you know put stats to them but uh for antagonists it's not really applicable you you try to give them a personality and give them motivations and stuff, but it be, it's going to be, again, less versatile. All right. That, that makes sense. And it, admittedly, that was, one, that was one of those, that was one of those things where I could, I could see, I could see that kind of leading down into as much as cliche as this term is a slippery slope regarding, um, Regarding regarding going away from that system agnostic into something that is system specific, yeah. Um, and speaking of speaking of system agnosticism, I do want to pivot into a bit of um, 
setting agnostic uh, ag ah agnosticism. Jeez, try saying that five times fast. I'm not even <laughs> sure that's a word, but yeah, go ahead. We will make it a <laughs> word, damn it. Um, what I'm cur what I'm curious about is when a lot of people, as I kind of hinted at, a lot of people definitely have the whole medieval approach with fantasy, but even with that, there's still a fair amount of wiggle room for um, variants. And I'm curious if if certain parts of it would uh, would address if somebody wanted to do um wanted to use this for a setting that is on the lower end of the fantasy spectrum, still a very European approach, but leaning more in the direction of Game of Thrones than Lord of the Rings. If you follow me, a hundred percent. Yeah, you can because I think that the the defining factor is often. Uh, the existence of magic or how prevalent mm -hmm. magic is mm -hmm. as well as the existence of uh, creatures, monstrous tr creatures and not the, the traditional creatures that we see in, in our world. Mm -hmm. So I think to a, uh, a medieval adventurer, a bear would be in, in, in a non-magical setting, a bear would be a very dangerous creature to encounter. A pack of wolves would be a very dangerous thing to encounter, uh, Whereas in the more fantastic world, we and you know getting into high fantasy, you know we're into dragons and we're we're into um, uh, well in in D and D obviously the uh, the Ocaloids and uh, uh, the um, spectators and beholders and stuff. Mm -hmm. So those get into the really weird and and obviously some sort of monster sort of uh, creature. So the answer to your question is this is applicable to any fantasy. Thing. you mm -hmm. it's up to you to use the tools that we're presenting to say this is this thing that's happening is being caused by magic mm -hmm. or this thing is just natural occurrence yeah uh the one thing that you would just if you wanted no magic whatsoever is completely omit the um magic as being a danger so one of the options for for the uh, danger section is magic, and mm -hmm. so you just ignore that one. You know, you use something different. And yeah. uh, if it if it is something um, magical, go go some other direction with it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that again, you try to make one book that's going to be as versatile as possible. You leave some of those extra details up to the player, uh, up to yeah. the, the the creator. And I'm I'm guessing this I'm guessing the same kind of thing would apply if somebody wanted to go the opposite end of the spectrum a very a very high magic is is literally everywhere and everybody knows how to use it approach almost yep. like the kind of thing you would see in a more Gonzo fantasy or a or a um wush or a uh, wush or chancha piece or even um, certain manga. In that case, ignore anything that is too mundane for you, mm -hmm. and just go with all the stuff that's super magical and and all that. Yeah. Uh, absolutely recommend doing that. You know, make it work with your world, and uh, and you should be fine. And I know we've we we talked a couple times about um, a lot of people's version of of doing fantasy tends to lean a far more European, but. I'm curious if um, if you if this could potentially be used for other for other styles because I um I've been a big fan of Legend of the Five Rings for decades and so and stuff stuff like that and its sister game Legend of the Burning Sands and given there it given the fact that they are as far removed from a European style as you can get. I'm curious if something like Dangerous Destinations could be used for that approach as well yes because again those details in the architecture or or what have you are left out mm -hmm. and so you could create something with a, a middle eastern theme or a an african theme mm -hmm. asian theme i'm just using the standard cultures we have on our planet yeah of course we we tend to apply these types of cultures into our creations. So if you did create something that was, that, that fell closer to one of these different uh, types of, of cultures and, um, and made sense to be in that setting, 
there's nothing in Dangerous Nations or even Petalo Settlements that that says you have to, you know, be in an, a European uh, style. Mm-hmm. There, all the concepts are simply concepts, and the the details are left up to you as far as um, you know what what things actually look like. Uh, the the um, there are certain settings like or environments like desert, for example, where desert most of us go to exactly the same place when it comes to a desert. You've got sandstone uh, uh, structures. And you have lots and lots of sand around, not a lot of trees and whatnot. But the fact is that there are a lot of different types of deserts. So, you know, go on Google, Mm -hmm. throw out some uh, some search terms and you can be inspired and go in a totally different direction than you might have gone uh, the last time that you created an environment uh, or an encounter in the desert. Yeah. And and. I was tempted to make the joke that if I if I if somebody really needs um exa- example mo- ex- a inspiration for example monsters from the real world just go to any just go to any bit of wilderness in Australia and you'll find plenty of stuff to work with. <laughs> yeah, there's some weird stuff <laughs> out there and I think that Australia is a great example of things that are strange to the mm-hmm. rest of us because it it was so isolated for so long mm-hmm. and uh you know marsupials being what they are they just inherently seem stranger than mammals and if i need to go with something more european i could always go with the with some of the nightmare force in eastern europe where where everything there wants to kill you mm-hmm. um and i with and a uh, which is an excellent case in point given the given how dark a lot of um the actual fairy tales in that area could get mm-hmm not the not the softer versions that we that we've grown up with, but stuff that leans more in the realm of of the Brothers Grimm and that kind of thing. Yeah, um, most most of the fairy tales, they're what they're based on are pretty dark. But uh, yeah, uh, good inspiration and stuff, but definitely mm-hmm. something you're not going to tell your kids. <laughs> um, I don't. I don't know. Some I don't know. Some parent probably got fooled into thinking of showing Watership down to their kids back in the day. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that one, but yeah. So, but the the answer to your question though is that the the uh, whatever setting you want and whatever mm-hmm. theme that you want, Dangerous Destinations doesn't um, doesn't rely on any specific theme. Uh, it it will be applicable to whatever you happen to be creating, and it's that's by design. Mm-hmm. And. Now, given that, how, I know that there's been, I know that there's been some some manner of um, stretch goals go, going down. But what are what it what are you shooting for as far as a page count size for the book? It should be similar to Spectacular Settlements. Uh, more than four hundred mm-hmm. at this point is what we're anticipating. We ended up with seventy-two pre-generated destinations and each one will be at least two pages probably more like three or four so just the math on that it's a pretty big section of the book and the rest of the book are the um so parts one through four are the destination type the environment the danger and the um antagonists Mm -hmm. so those four sections are essentially the builder if you will and then section five is the whole you know, 72 pre-generated destinations. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a lot of content. Uh, And I anticipate that parts one through five are going to be about half the book and part, excuse me, part one through four are going to be about half the book and part five will be the other half of the book just because of the the size of the, um, you know, the the 72 uh, pre-gens and them being two to four pages each. All right. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. And I'm get um, I'm guessing that the digital version of it will be properly bookmarked. Yeah, always. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the things that you guys that you guys have done that I that you think would you think wouldn't be as novel a concept concept these days as it as it turns out to be, but that but that's how it is, I guess. Is the is the concept of VIP games? You know, ho- hosting mm-hmm. hosting game sessions for backers. Um, 
Now, I will admit that I'm a little bit late to the party when it comes to when it comes to a good chunk of the output that you guys have had, but is this something that you guys have done in the past? And what no. prompted this particular idea? No, this is brand new. And this is, um, there's a couple of things we're, we're developing beyond Dangerous Destinations. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them is an adventure anthology from our Heroes of High Fantasy series. And what the VIP games will be, not only is it going to be a, a game session for you and uh, four other players, uh, but you'll also get access to all of that material we used during that game to do on your own and, and play your own game uh, with it. And uh, I think it's a, a fun opportunity to not only connect with our community, in more of a personal way because mm -hmm. we don't, we can't do conventions right now. And that's been a major bummer, but we're trying to you know work through it. That's one of the things that I love most about what we do is to actually go to the conventions and play with people and, uh, and get to see people face to face. But because we can't do that, we figured this would be a good alternative and how could we make it worth buying a ticket to um, to attend, mm -hmm. so uh, the VIP tickets are basically all about just getting back into uh, those those personal games, as well as giving the uh, a great experience for the players and also all that playtest material. So they'll get access to that stuff early on, and they'll also get credited in the book. Uh, in that book, that product, uh, the Adventure Anthology, as uh, playtesters. Mm -hmm. So if we are using settlements and destinations to create the bulk of the story around these adventures that we're doing, and from the get-go we have uh, cool graphics and pre-generated characters and all, and maps and everything, uh, it'll make for a great experience for mm -hmm. the uh, for the backers and then they'll be able to take all that material uh, just being by being a, a uh, play tester and go and try it out and give us some feedback on yeah. um, their own games. And when it comes to when it comes to those sessions, is there a particular um, is there a particular platform for virtual tabletop that you're that you're using for that or are you doing it strictly via voice? We're going to be using Shard virtual tabletop and mm -hmm. uh, that's the plan so far. Uh, and we're going to be doing some partnership deals with Shard on a couple of things. So, yeah, more information for that will be coming out yeah. soon. But uh, that's the plan so far. If, for some reason, people would prefer a different one, uh, you know, they, you know, they like Roll20 better or, or whatever, we may be able to accommodate that. But Shard seems to be the lightest of all of them and um, one of the easiest to just bring new information into and and create your characters and all that so we're going to be trying it out that way uh, if for some reason our our backers are are you know prefer a different one then we can see about accommodating that but uh i mean i've even gone so far as to just have everyone on google hangout and i set up everything in the real world and just put a little webcam and move the webcam around mm -hmm. uh to move the miniatures and all that so um but yeah, we've one way or another. It'll be uh, it'll be awesome. Yeah, um, I had heard I had heard about Shard recently when the when the news broke about their um, pro project. What was what was the reason you got you guys went with um, went with that particular platform? I think it, ease of use is the main mm -hmm. thing. Uh, I have tried with Roll Twenty a couple of times, and it, there's an awful lot to it, and I'm not. Uh, uncomputer savvy. I'm very computer savvy, but uh, there's just a lot of to learn with the interface that uh, has been challenging for me the past couple times that I've tried to use it. Um, so Shard is a very, very light um, virtual tabletop mm -hmm. compared to other options out there. So uh, it seems like it's going to be, um, so far, my experience with it, it has been very positive. Mm -hmm. Oh. And I'm get I'm guessing I'm guessing these particular sessions would be would be run as one shots that would go a few, that would go a few hours, one shots up to six hours, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm get um, in 
within those one shots, would you be handling character creation as well, or would be people playing um, pre gens? People that have pre gens, and as with all of my games, pre gens come with their own intrigue, relationships with each other, motivations, why they're already a group, that mm-hmm. kind of thing, and um, it, it makes for some some great role play, and it also gets you right off to the adventure instead of everyone spending a certain amount of time creating characters. I absolutely um, love character creation, but when you're trying to do a one shot and you're trying to do it in a certain amount of time, uh, it just, I think makes more sense for the storyteller to come with heroes who are uh, already established. And there's already a reason that they're together and, and put that kind of information on the character sheet and give them connections to each other. Now, when it comes to those intrigues, is it presented like a series of bullet points? Uh, often, I, I present it more like um, inner dialogue. Mm-hmm. So it's it's sort of like uh, if you're looking around the table at other characters, you've got, you know, um, Drizella the halfling is my closest friend, and but I don't really trust the um the tiefling or something like that you know little little things like that about their um relationships with each other and to give them good role-playing cues as to how they would react or behave around each other uh but also some overarching story like the the person who is the the de facto leader let's say of the group has a little bit more information about the quest and everyone else needs to get you know, take their cues from that, that person, let's say, Mm -hmm. Uh, or there's certain information that someone might have that they're trying to keep a secret about. Uh, Like they, they know the, uh, the villain of the story personally or something, you know, there, there, there are things that I always build into the adventure where uh, they're going to have, every character will have a certain amount of intrigue that maybe other people don't, necessarily know and it's it's revealed during the adventure let's say if they decide to reveal it yeah and within given the fact that it's based on um in, based on um inner di- inner dialogue i'm get i'm guessing i'm guessing the inner dialogue thing also is also is to help with um cues for the player yes yeah because the player needs to know what they're thinking, what their mm-hmm. character is thinking about a certain person or a certain situation. So you might even include things that uh, they, they're wary about the current quest or they're super excited about the quest because they really need to pay off some debts or whatever. Mm-hmm. So those kinds of things I always build in to give them a reason to make a certain decision at one point or another. Uh, additionally, their relationships to each other and why are they going to stick their neck out for this person over here if they get into a jam if it's not really within their character to do that. So if they're kind of a selfish person, they're only in it for the money and, hey, we can do four-way split now because that one died, you're going to include that kind of information. You should. And if there's a reason they would step out of that character uh, to save someone's life or whatever, there's probably something you should include uh, even if it's as petty as we'd probably do better with one extra person because of this reason, you know, even if there's not a, a personal connection to that, that uh, other character that they decided to stick their neck out for, even if it's just a practical thing, it includes something about that in their personality somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and everything beyond that, you know, leave up to the fifth edition. Uh, we're going to be playing fifth edition, for these, but uh, leave it up to the fifth edition um, uh, bonds, flaws, ideals, you know, characteristic that that kind of thing mm-hmm. to fill in the blanks on that. But any any interpersonal relationships and stuff, I always try to establish to give them a good idea of do they know this person who's part of their party? Do they not know them? Do they trust them? Do they not trust them? All that stuff. Yeah, I can I can definitely get behind that kind of that kind of thing. Um, and I can I can understand why you're why you're setting it up with um. With up with up to five people because I'd say five people is the limit for a for a single GM's sanity. I know some people do more, yeah. and I usually say you're going to be end up end up in a straitjacket in three years. <laughs> virtual, so in in person seven is my comfort zone. In on virtual five because virtually it's going to be more difficult to get around the table uh, than it would be in person. Mm-hmm. So 
for this for the in the interest of everyone getting a good amount of interaction in the game uh i i think five is reasonable yeah i can i can definitely see i can definitely see that my my tip my happy median myself tip is around four or five um anything anything more than that is asking for trouble yeah <laughs> um I I've known I've known some people that will that will do ten, that will do ten and I'm I'm sitting here going how the hell are you gonna manage that and you're gonna have combats where the where the the encounter is gonna be done by sunrise it's pretty chaotic <laughs> yeah so I I try to avoid that as much as possible mm -hmm. I always also do uh, pretty light combats uh, don't uh, don't make it overly complicated and mm -hmm. uh, focus more on the story and the role playing aspect and mm -hmm. I. I know that over the past few years, my players at conventions have definitely appreciated that uh, because if you're if you're into character creation and min maxing and all that stuff, then you're a lot more into combat. If you're given a pre generated character, don't don't focus so much on the min maxing and the combat. Focus on the story and having a really great experience. Mm -hmm. Well. Uh, given given all of that, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Not a release date, just a general window, because obviously these kind of things are always in flux. Um, a release. Uh, so we know that the the book we expect to deliver by, um, uh, I think it's January February of twenty twenty two. So um, that is going to be. Um, uh, when the hardcover is is delivered, as far as the PDF, though, we're expecting that to come out around the same time that we send the files to production. So whenever that's going to, probably during the summertime, sometime. Mm -hmm. a, and I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how that how that pans out. Yeah, it's going to be exciting. Mm -hmm. And. Just and just to make sure I don't just to make sure I don't end up inadvertently jinxing you. Okay, jinx averted. <laughs> but with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come to brave the hell of time zones and come up to the temple and enjoy the madness. Yeah, thanks for the interview. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the campaign we've just got what 10 days mm -hmm. left i think and uh so it's getting down to the wire it's pretty mm -hmm. exciting but um yeah thanks for the interview and uh thanks for your audience checking it out and uh make sure that if you are interested you take a look before the 11th of uh february that's mm -hmm. the day that it ends 11th of uh, february at uh, 12 noon pacific standard time mm -hmm. so we'll be doing a live stream while it's ending so if you want to join us for that and mm -hmm. and we'll be building more Dangerous destinations on the fly with everybody uh, should be a lot of fun. Right. And of course, any, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around <laughs> here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Sounds good. Appreciate the interview. Yep. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>